Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In this episode, we proceed to the second pope to be remembered by the Church as great. And the greatness of Pope Gregory I is manifest in the legacy of beautiful things that are permanently memorialized as his. His name has attached itself to institutions and authoritative books still today. We speak of Gregorian chant, Gregorian masses, the Gregorian mission, the Gregorian sacramentary, etc. Gregory is quite literally a household name in the Catholic Church. Though he was a monk, he was also a man of action, and his 14-year papacy was a long and steady storm of decisions, programs, missions, and reforms. It seemed that Gregory was born for greatness. He was even bred for greatness. He belonged to a distinguished Roman senatorial family, the Gens Anicia. Gregory's genealogy stretched back almost a millennium by the time he was born. The Anici are first mentioned at the end of the 4th century BC, and over the years their household included many illustrious figures. They were consuls and governors and senators and generals. They associated with Cicero and other literary luminaries. In the Christian era, they themselves produced the poet Proba and the philosopher Boethius. And Gregory's great-great-grandfather had been Pope Felix III. The family was extremely wealthy and had extensive land holdings in Italy and Sicily. In Rome, the family lived on the exclusive Chalian Hill. Their palace sat beside palaces built by some of the great emperors of the past. People expected greatness from a son born to such a family, but Gregory's achievements were extraordinary even for his illustrious family. None of his predecessors was his equal, nor was any member of the Gens Anicia in the centuries that followed. Gregory was born around 540. His mother, Sylvia, was a pious Christian woman and has been honored as a saint since ancient times. His father served as a senator and briefly as prefect of Rome, the highest municipal office in the city. Gregory's young years were a time of tumult for families and civil service. Justinian was the Byzantine emperor, and he is also known to history as the Great. He had outsized ambitions. He wanted nothing less than to recover the lost glory of the Roman Empire. And so he pursued wars of reconquest that were long, bloody, and fabulously expensive. And Justinian succeeded. Over time, he reconquered Italy, Africa, and much of Spain, all lands that had been lost to barbarians in the preceding century. He fought relentlessly, and he won. But his victory devastated the reconquered provinces, especially Italy. Justinian's hard-won battles were followed by fragile peace, and often accompanied by disaster. Rome was hit by plague during Gregory's childhood, and then suffered a murderous sacking at the hands of Totila, king of the Ostrogoths, in 546. It was no easy job to be prefect of Rome during such times. The never-ending war affected everything, and the resulting tax burden weighed heavily on everyone. Gregory's family may have moved frequently during these upheavals, avoiding the dangers by hopscotching from one property to another. Nevertheless, Gregory managed to receive an excellent education in the literature of classical Rome and Orthodox Christianity. His parents prepared him well for civic leadership, which was an obligation that came with their patrimony. While in his early thirties, Gregory himself became prefect of Rome, and he served admirably for a few years. At the death of his father, however, he made a momentous decision— Though he now possessed all the family's wealth, he would dedicate it all, and dedicate the rest of his life to the service of God. He turned the Chalian palace into a monastery, which he named for St. Andrew, 
and he founded six more monasteries on the family's properties in Sicily. Gregory eagerly took up the disciplines of the ascetic life, which he shared in community with several friends. For him, the keynotes of monastic life were prayer, the study of scripture, and the cultivation of humility. It seems likely that he followed the model of famous Italian ascetics, like Benedict of Nursia. Gregory would later go on to write the first biography of Benedict. There is no evidence, however, that Gregory observed Benedict's rule, and to call his monastery Benedictine would be to risk anachronism. The establishment of a Benedictine order was still centuries away in the future. Still, Gregory's name has always been associated with that of Benedict, and rightly so. We can be certain that Benedict influenced Gregory in a profound way, and we know that Gregory extended Benedict's influence by telling his story and promoting his particular style of asceticism. Gregory loved his new life, where the days were given to contemplation in ordered community. But it was not to last. Gregory had rich experience in diplomacy and governance, and the times had need of those skills. Pope Pelagius II called him out of retirement to serve the church. Pelagius ordained Gregory a deacon and sent him at first on important missions in the Italian peninsula. Then in 579, Gregory became the Pope's Apocrisiarius, his ambassador to the emperor's court in Constantinople. It was a job of critical importance. The world order established by Justinian was rapidly crumbling. Many of the old aristocratic families had fled Rome, and increasingly the Pope was forced by circumstance to assume the duties associated with municipal government. Thus it became the Pope's responsibility to petition the distant emperor for protection or plead for humanitarian aid. It was Gregory who argued every case before the throne on behalf of the Pope, the Church, the City of Rome, and the Christian West. His efforts were often frustrated. Justinian's glories had proven to be a debacle for his successors. The government was deeply in debt, and the people were disaffected, and the barbarians were back, pressing at every border. The fierce Lombards had taken advantage of the situation by slowly invading Italy again, laying siege to one city after another. During Gregory's years at the capital, he saw little success. The emperor was concerned about more immediate threats at the northern and eastern borders. Rome was a city whose importance and population had dwindled almost to nothing. Italy was just another problem that had been inherited from Justinian. The emperors mostly ignored the papal Apocrisiarius. Gregory, however, took great consolation in the company of other monks from the West. He never gained fluency in the Greek language, so he made community. In exile from their own lands, these men made community together. Some, like Leander of Seville, were rather brilliant. To these men Gregory delivered the series of talks that became his long commentary on the biblical book of Job, a book that many consider his masterpiece. Gregory served in the capital till 586, when Pelagius recalled him to Rome. On his return, he took up residence as a simple monk in the monastery he had founded. But the elderly pope continued to call upon him, and Gregory's reputation grew. The beleaguered city needed heroes, and Gregory had all the markings of one. He was brilliant. He was competent. He cared about the people of Rome. Yet he was humble, formed by the monastic life to serve Christ above all, and then Christ in others. In 589, the Tiber River flooded, claiming many lives and destroying property. Worse than the flood, however, was the pandemic that followed. Rats from the riverside invaded the city, spreading bubonic plague. The disease reduced a city that had already been cut down by a century of disasters. The disease was indifferent to wealth or social status. Every neighborhood was affected. In February of 590, the plague took Pope Pelagius. Rome grieved, but there was never any doubt about succession. The people shouted their desire for Gregory to be Pope. 
The clergy, who were papal electors, agreed with the people. Gregory was Rome's unanimous choice. Well, almost unanimous. Gregory was the lone dissenter. He appealed to the emperor to allow him to remain a simple monk. He argued that the election had been invalid because of gross violations of protocol. In the meantime, Gregory continued his works of mercy in the city. He led an enormous public procession in which the people of Rome repented their sins and begged heaven for deliverance from the plague. By all natural standards, the event should have been a superspreader, but it wasn't. In fact, the pandemic ceased, and it looked like a miracle. The people gave glory to God and intercessory credit to Gregory. In short order, word arrived from the capital that the emperor had rejected Gregory's appeal. Gregory would be Pope. Gregory accepted his new role as the will of God. He recognized the necessity of authority, but he diminished the honorifics that adorned the office. He rejected titles such as Ecumenical Patriarch, which had lately been taken up by the Patriarch of Constantinople, and instead referred to himself as the Servant of the Servants of God. This was reflective of the true nature of hierarchy, whose root meaning is sacred order. Sacred order. Jesus had told his apostles, Let the greatest among you become as the least, and the leader as one who serves. Such was the duty of an aristocrat, Gregory would say, and especially a monk, and most especially the Pope. As bishop, Gregory set a new standard for industry. Just a fraction of his correspondence survives, and yet it's voluminous, more than 800 letters, most of them on matters of urgent pastoral or administrative concern. The old world order had all but completely broken down but no one was stepping forward with a proposal to replace it. Entropy was the force shaping Italy's future, and the future of the West in general, and the Church was suffering the same sort of collapse. Gregory could have spent his years putting out fires, facing each daily crisis as it came. In fact, he did that rather admirably, but he saw that more was needed. So he initiated a series of programmatic institutional reforms. He worked to renew and reform the liturgy. He established new expectations for the formation of clergy. He promoted monastic life, and he elevated monks to influential positions within the church. He sponsored missions into pagan lands, and he reached out to heretics and pagans living in his own territory. Gregory was also a prolific writer and a tireless preacher. His homilies on the Gospels and on the book of the prophet Ezekiel have survived, but the ancients possessed many others. He produced commentaries on many books of the Bible, Genesis through Judges, Job, First and Second Kings, Proverbs, the Song of Songs, and the Prophets. Most, alas, have been lost. He composed a detailed instruction for the spiritual and personal formation of clergy. His pastoral rule is a handbook for the cultivation of the character and skills needed for the exercise of the offices of the church. Each chapter guides the candidate along a virtuous course between opposing vices. Such books serve to shape culture in the age to come. Gregory's four books of dialogues were similarly popular and influential. He strove to edify and amaze, emphasizing the saints' miracles and apparitions and other extraordinary events in their lives. Gregory's dialogues would serve as a treasury of images for artists and poets in the millennium to come. As he carried out his liturgical reforms, he got resistance and pushback. A bishop in Sicily complained that Gregory had been unduly influenced by his years in Constantinople and was now trying to Greek up the Latin liturgy. In responding, Gregory provided evidence of many developments in the liturgy since the first century. He noted that the Latin custom of saying the Alleluia before the Gospel had been introduced into the liturgy during the fourth century, quote, derived from the Church of Jerusalem by the tradition of the Blessed Jerome in the time of Pope Damasus, end quote. And he asserted his personal belief that the most primitive liturgy, the Liturgy of the Apostles, was simply the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. 
Yet by Gregory's time, the liturgy had developed into something quite elaborate. Seen from that perspective, Gregory's changes seemed small indeed. Among his most significant projects was the evangelization of the British Isles. That mission he entrusted to a monk named Augustine, who was Gregory's successor as prior at the Roman monastery of St. Andrew. In correspondence with his missionaries, Gregory gave wise advice for enculturating the faith. He advised them not to destroy pagan shrines, but rather consecrate them to Christian use, accommodating the native people's habits and customs and feasts when possible. Again, Gregory's council set a standard for the centuries of missionary activity that followed. Though travel as a whole declined during the Dark Ages, Christian missions flourished, and Gregory deserves much of the credit for launching that project. In the absence of any effective secular power, Gregory took whatever actions were necessary for the good of his people. If the emperor would not take action to bring peace to Italy, then Gregory would strive to do it himself. Thus, on his own initiative, and much to the annoyance of the emperor, he undertook negotiations with the Lombards, the despised and very brutal invaders of Italy's territory. In his correspondence, moreover, he showed tender concern not only for his own people, but also for the Lombards. Gregory desired not only their non-aggression, but their conversion. Though he deplored their actions, he saw them as potential Christians, and he urged the bishops of Italy to take initiatives for evangelizing them. Gregory was not a speculative thinker. No one goes to Gregory in search of philosophical analysis or systematic exposition. His appeal is in his directness and simplicity. His abiding concern was to present Christian faith and morals in a way that could be understood and lived out. Nevertheless, his works have inspired theologians down the ages. From Gregory's many digressions in the Moralia and the Pastoral Rule, later writers have gathered all the ingredients for an integrated ascetical and mystical theology. Gregory's greatness is undeniable, but his accomplishments are all the more impressive because they were carried out by a man who suffered chronic and severely ill health. Gregory suffered poor health throughout his papacy. He had constant indigestion and frequent fevers. Through the second half of his papacy, he had such a severe case of gout that he often could not get out of bed, yet his pace never seemed to slow. Some of his greatest homilies were delivered by proxy. Gregory died in 604, and his canonization followed the precedent of his election as the people immediately acclaimed him a saint. He is beloved in the city still today, but also in the world. Europe built a new culture by the brilliant lights of his work and his example. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I ask you to please consider making a donation. We're entirely listener-funded. Just visit us at catholicculture.org and look for the button that says Donate. Mention that you love the fathers. We're grateful for anything you can give. Remember, we pray for our benefactors every day. And I thank you for listening. De quorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, Listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.